Okay, so today we are going to cover um, what's known as postmodern architecture, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, planning, 20th century planning and preservation movement as well. And then I think we'll have time, we'll start maybe talking a little bit about contemporary architecture. So I like this title slide. Uh, I don't know if anyone's ever seen this before, uh, but it's, <laughs> it's a good way to end our conversation about uh, Miesian architecture uh, and is um, the transition into postmodern architecture. This is a collage done by Stanley Tigerman, the late Stanley Tigerman, who was a, uh, well-known uh, local architect, uh, educator. He, I think he taught at the Circle Campus uh, for many, many years. Uh, and he also uh, established his own sort of design school here locally. Um, and uh, along with his uh, partner and, and life partner, Margaret McCurry. Uh, this is a collage of obviously of Crown Hall sinking into Lake Michigan. Uh, and he did this to represent the the end of Miesian architecture, which isn't quite true. Uh, I think it's still with us, as we'll see when we start talking about um, contemporary architecture a little bit. But uh, it's still kind of a, a funny thing. I think this is on in the collection at the Art Institute of Chicago. Um, I'm not exactly sure where it's shown, uh, but I, I believe it's on display somewhere in one of the galleries. Has anyone seen this before? I haven't. Yeah. Yeah. Well, anyway, sometime explore the Art Institute a little bit. Uh, it's probably like in the architecture galleries, um, and you'll probably see this. But uh, so that leads us into um, the idea of, of postmodern architecture. And probably the one of the great masters of that, um, ironically, is Philip Johnson. Uh, I say ironically because he was the one who established the 1932 MoMA exhibition that coined the name international style, really promoted the idea of the, the sort of international modernist architecture of the 20th century. Uh, and he was a, um, a big promoter of that and, uh, and a practitioner. Uh, he had a close collaboration with Mies van der Rohe, uh, especially in the 1950s, um, and then abandoned it and really became a trendsetter for the, the postmodern movement. And this is an image of him shown with his uh, famous AT&T building in New York that I'll talk about momentarily. Um, so kind of a kind of a strange you know, turn of twist of fate. Uh, but we see that a lot. Almost all the postmodern architects had, had, had come of age in the modernist era and had worked or studied or both under modernist architects. And then, you know, rejected it, you know, um, wholeheartedly in many cases. So I'll show you a couple of examples of Johnson's work. Um, one of his best known is his own house. This is the, he just called it Glass House uh, in New Haven, Connecticut from 1949. And if you remember, we talked about Farnsworth House by Mies um, last time. And this is similar to that. It's a glass house like the Farnsworth house is. Um, it's steel and glass, you know, almost nothing. The, the quote that Mies had about his architecture. Um, this has a brick chimney core. Um, actually, there's a bathroom in there too. But it has kind of a brick core, uh, which is a little different than what the Farnsworth house is painted black. Uh, and this is not set up on pilotes up off the ground the way the Farnsworth house was, uh, which was partly done to um, alleviate the, the flooding that, that occurred on the site of the Farnsworth House and still does. Um, this sits on top of a hill, so there wasn't an issue with flooding, so he just put this on a slab. Uh, but this, is, this actually predates Farnsworth House, um, but Farnsworth House predates this in design concept. And um, uh, there, there are a number of stories uh, from Mises associates who you know, worked in his office that Johnson would come into the office and go through the files uh, and and was looking at the Farnsworth House files and was was copying basically literally copying details and sort of inspiration um, from the design of the Farnsworth House even though it hadn't quite been built yet. Uh, so this is really a, a copy almost directly out of of the Farnsworth house. It just, you know, he changed some things. Um, and I guess Mies found it flattering. He never seemed to, to care too much. And they worked together 
uh, on several major projects, including the Seagram building. Uh, they were partners um, to some extent on the Seagram building. Here's a plan of the glass house uh, and you can see it's you know very simple has no walls in it other than this uh, circular fireplace and bathroom core um, everything else is left open like a universal space again that was Mises concept uh, so he's really showing you this to really show you that he had fully embraced uh, the Miesian aesthetic and planning principles uh, but then he does something like this this is from 1984 um, uh, the AT&T building in New York City. And this is taking a modernist, almost international style building, you know, pretty straightforward shaft of the tower here. But then at the tippy top, he creates this broken pediment. And it's actually, I think in the next slide we see, it's inspired, literally, and he, he had fully admitted this, it was inspired by the top of a Chippendale chest. Um, uh, we, we briefly mentioned Chippendale way back in the semester when we talked about neoclassical uh, architecture from like the 18th century in England. And Chippendale was an, an important interior designer then. And this is an example of one of his pieces and many very influential. There are many early American and, you know, English furniture makers that, you know, essentially copied this. And so this one has a curved top and all that, you know, obviously it's quite more decorative, uh, but he just sort of took that concept and put that on the top of the building here. Um, and this was, you know, this was a break. This was sort of just a pure decorative element. And this is not what modernism is supposed to be. We saw very, very plain expression of structure and form, like in the Mesian tradition. And we saw expressionist architecture where architects would use different materials and different forms that were structural and that were related to the uh, the function of the building, much you know, in in um, honor of Sullivan's form follows function quote. But this this has nothing to do with the function of the building. It's just stuck up there on the top. It looks like it's somewhat integrated, uh, but it has no functional purpose. It doesn't express anything about what the building is or what it's doing or what's happening inside. It's just added on. That's ornament. Uh, we'll see more explicit examples of ornamentation as we go along here. Um, but that's what makes this postmodern. And uh, the movement started in the 1970s. Uh, this is a little later into it, but this is one of the most famous examples of postmodern architecture. And you can see uh, the building in the context of uh, Midtown Manhattan. Here's the base of the building. And this is another, you know, when, when I showed you just the top and the tower, it looked fairly straightforward, Miesian, except for the very top. But again, at the base, we see this just massively exaggerated forms, uh, Roman arches and vaults, uh, really massive stone masonry with massive uh, keystone uh, lintels here. Uh, really not, you know, Mesian at all. It's not, you know, anything of the modernist tradition that we had been seeing. And it's, it's just pure form. You know, again, it's not doing any really functional purpose here. It's not expressing anything about the building. It's just pure form. And that's, that's postmodern. Uh, and he also worked uh, both in collaboration with John Burgi. Uh, they, they did a similar thing here in Chicago at 190 South LaSalle in 1986. Um, doesn't, this building doesn't just have a name to it. It's just 190 South LaSalle. And you can see at the top of this building, it has these pediments and a copper roof and almost little filigree uh, on the ridge of the roof. It has little, you know, big globe lights there. And this is a direct inspiration from the uh, Masonic Temple building by Burnham and Root. This had um, been, at one point, it was the tallest building in the world um, when it was first built in Chicago. Um, didn't last very long. This was an era where buildings were getting built all the time, so uh, the records were didn't stand very long. But um, this was at the corner of State Street and Randolph. It got torn down in the 1930s uh, when they were building the State Street subway. Uh, they the the excavations for the subway they were afraid would damage the foundations of this building and the building was by that time 
considered to be old and you know not pretty particularly functional anymore. We'll talk about this when we talk about the preservation at the end of this lecture. Uh, and so the solution was, well, let's just tear this thing down. And it actually sat uh, as a two-story Walgreens for, for decades. It was only in the last uh, 10, 15 years that they actually built uh, uh, more of a high rise on that site. But this was the direct inspiration uh, for 190 South LaSalle. And you can see the pediment roofs and the steep pitched roof. It's not a copy. It's not meant to be a copy, um, but they, they, they knew of this building. They, they had these kinds of images of it. And they said, well, let's, you know, let's sort of create a sort of pseudo modern version of it. And you can even see the, the arched openings here on the top of the tower and the arched openings on the top of the tower here. Um, and again, it's just sort of a way to make the building look interesting. It has nothing to do with the function. It has nothing to do with the structure or anything. It's just a way to make it look interesting, and that's what makes it postmodern. And at the base of the building, we see this sort of heavy masonry with a big, giant, you know, Roman arched arches and so forth. Um, that was a hallmark of postmodern architecture as well. This sort of exaggerated scale, like we saw at the AT&T building at the bottom and at the base of this building, these big, massive Roman arches that um, you know, just sort of take an element and, you know, you blow it up times 10 and you stick it on the building. Uh, that's, that's pretty classic postmodern. Right? Uh, perhaps one of the earliest uh, practitioners in this genre is Robert Venturi and later joined by his wife um, and business partner, Denise Scott Brown. Um, and again, Venturi worked in the modernist manner. He, you know, associated with Louis Kahn and Eero Saarinen. You know, we talked about them. Um, and his early work was modernist. But then he really broke out in um, with his book, Complexity and Contradiction in Architecture. And he coined the term, the turn of the phrase of Mises, less is more. He, he paraphrased that and says, less is a bore. You know, like, you know, we've seen so much of this. And part of this is a reaction to the to the success of the international style and the success of Nisian uh, internationalism. Um, cities, you know, starting in the 1950s, by the end of the 1960s, after 20 years, almost everything getting built is Nisian and is modernist. And, you know, people started getting tired of it. To be quite honest, you know, it, it was interesting. Um, I, I think a couple of us might have discussed this at the end of last lecture, where um, or the lecture before, where you know I liked showing you the historic views of some of the early modernist buildings because you see it in context of the older buildings that it was built in at the time, um, and now all around these modernist buildings or more modernist buildings, and so you lose that sense of how groundbreaking these buildings were. And by the end of the 1960s, that was happening. People like Venturi were saying, you know what, we've done this. It's there. We need to do something different. And, you know, it's getting boring. So um, that's how this sort of movement emerges out of, um, of that thinking. So here's a uh, the cover of Complexity and Contradiction Architecture. And it was really, you know, celebrating the idea that, you know, good architecture should be complex. It should have you know, contradictions to it. It shouldn't just be a plain box that can be anything. It can be a church, it can be a house, it can be an office building. Um, it, it ought to be more reflective of what it truly is, the way architecture was historically. I mean, everything we've talked about from the beginning of last semester all the way till just recently, what, you know, the architecture was more of its time, of its place, and, um, People like Venturi felt like we were losing that. And he celebrated quirky little things like this, you know, that this little um, duck house or whatever. Um, I, I think this is like a little roadside stand, you know, or, you know, selling trinkets or something like that. I forget the details. Um, but, you know, it's kitschy, you know, and, and he liked that. He's like, you know, this is fun. If you're driving down the highway and you see a duck, <laughs> You know, you're going to want to stop. You're going to want to like see, see what's in there and then maybe you'll buy something, right? Um, if you just saw a Mesian box, 
you'd be like, eh, I'll just keep going, you know, unless it says it's gas and you need gas. Um, but if you see a duck, it doesn't matter what it is. You don't need a sign. You're going to stop. You're going to want to check it out. And he thought that was fun. So here's a couple of examples of uh, some of his early work. This is known as Guild House in Philadelphia from 1961. This is before he partnered with Scott Brown. Um, but what we see here are a basic geometric forms and massings of modernist architecture, you know, square windows and all that. But he introduces these quirky little things. You've got this sort of big semicircular window at the top. Look at the slits at the very top of the parapet up here. These are not functional. These are not doing anything. They're decorative. They're pure decorative. Uh, and that's postmodern. Um, uh, it's, it's not applied ornament the way we see with, you know, gargoyles or, you know, um, you know, Greek or Roman decorations or something like that, but it's still ornament because it has absolutely no functional purpose. It's just applied there to make the building look interesting. And he does something similar for his mother's house. Um, this is the Vanna Venturi house in Philadelphia from 1964. And he takes, you know, this very dramatic geometric massing, this sort of triangular form. He breaks the triangle at the top, almost in a similar way that um, Johnson would do later at the top of the AT&T building. Um, he sort of has this offset massing of the chimney. You got, you know, big rectangular massing here, and then he sticks Slu up a little bit higher uh, just to create a little bit of visual interest there. But then he applies ornament in this case too. This little arc right here is, is applied. That's ornament, you know, uh, this, you know, and the little belt course at the very bottom here is just applied ornamentation to the building just to give it a little more visual interest. Uh, so he's using a little combination here a stair. I'm not sure, Bea, does this have a, a stair that leads to nowhere? I wouldn't put it past him. Um, those are the kinds of quirky things that he liked to do, but I'm, I'm not sure if that's the case here or not. Here's a historic view. That's his mother sitting out front. Um, I'm not sure what she thought of the house either, but uh, she lived in it, so I guess she, she was okay with it. But uh, if your son's an architect, you'll be pretty happy that he designs a house for you, I guess. So. Uh, so here's the rear view of it, and you can see, you know, some of the more of the quirky things. Some of the brick is left exposed of the backside of the chimney. You got these really weird uh, geometries on the back of the house. We see more of that applied belt course trim. Um, just, you know, a really cobbled together. It's almost like taking a bunch of geometric shapes and blocks and things and just sticking them all together in almost an abstract way. Um, that's that's postmodernism. That's not anything out of the modernist tradition. So here is uh, uh, here's Denise Scott Brown um, standing at Las Vegas, and his next famous book was from 1972, Learning from Las Vegas, that he did with Denise Scott Brown, and and here's where he really, or the two of them, really celebrate the visual clutter of the highway strip. You know, and you you drive down, you know, uh, you, when you get outside of town and you're driving down the highway and you've got gas stations, you've got fast food restaurants, you've got strip malls, hotel or motels, and they all have their signs. Back in this day, they, they probably had neon signs that at night were glowing and flashing and, and had little decorated elements on them or arrows pointing to the business. And it was just massive visual clutter. Let me go to the next slide. I think we see that. Uh, yeah, here, the, just massive visual clutter. And, you know, most urban planners are like, oh, this is what we try to fight against. This We hate this. And, you know, Venturi and Scott Brown were like, this is kind of cool. This is fun. This is, this is real, right? This, if you let the market do its thing, this is what you get. And they felt that that was authentic, right? Um, if, you know, every business is trying to, you know, grab your attention and they have to be bigger and bolder and flashier because the, the sign in front of them is big and bold and flashy. And so uh, they kind of celebrated that idea of, of embracing that. Okay, so another um, 
extremely uh, well-known um, and successful postmodern architect is Michael Graves, um, who passed away a few years ago. Um, and again, he started out as a modernist, um, but by the 80s had shifted and embraced the postmodern movement and really created some of the most significant and important works, um, mostly in the 1980s of the postmodern work. And he actually, uh, later in his life, I think, you know, late 90s, early 2000s, uh, collaborated with Target uh, to create a line of products uh, um, that I'll show you an example of. Some of you might even still have some in your house. Uh, or if you go to Target, I think they still sell some of these things. Uh, one of his most important works is the uh, Municipal Building, i.e. City Hall from 1980 in Portland. And this, I think, really shows you the concept of taking a modernist box with a grid of windows and then applying a whole bunch of stuff to it, you know, different using different materials and true decoration. These, these little triangle things that are sticking out, these almost like little ribbons or something, abstracted ribbons at the top of uh, these here. Um, so he's using a little bit of combination of materials, of form, and of just applied decorative elements to create a decorative building um, and you know this is far outside of the Miesian aesthetic or the modernist um, you know principles and ideals sadly this building has been pretty mucked up uh, the city of Portland it needed a lot of work on uh, the city of Portland in the last I don't know 10 years or so uh, basically refacaded it um, I don't have a contemporary view of it but it's been pretty dramatically altered um, and this has fallen out of favor now too. You know, I mean, uh, this is, everything is cyclical, right? So, you know, starting in the 1970s, people in general um, and architects really began to, you know, kind of look back at the international style and go, yeah, we're done with that. Let's do something different. And so they did something like this, postmodernism. And then by the 90s, postmodernism falls out of favor and people are like, yeah, we're done with this. Let's move on. And so, you know, in the, two th in the 2010s, when Portland says, hey, we need to do a lot of work on this building, they're like, you know, this thing's old. It's, it does, it, it's out of style. It doesn't look good. And I always sort of equate um, the, the cycle of, of sort of fashion and, and what's popular to, you know, if you think about fashion, if you think about, if you look at uh, like a photo or, or photos of when your parents were young, and you look at like their hairstyle and their, you know, what they're wearing and, you know, and you think, oh my God, look at them. They look so weird. They're so silly. But then think about looking at like the same thing of your grandparents. If you've seen photos of your grandparents' wedding or, you know, even a generation before that, um, your great grandparents or something. And you think, wow, look at that. Grandma and Grandpa, they look so hip. They look so cool. You know, you think of like the 1920s, the flappers or something, you know, that style. Or even, you know, like the, the late 40s or, or you know, right, right around World War II. And that looks kind of cool. And I think that's, you know, where we, we look at what happened just before us and we think, Ugh. and then we look at the, what happened a few generations before us and we think, hey, that's pretty cool. They were, they were pretty hip back then. And the same thing kind of applies to architecture. Uh, so this is a really over the top, you know, he's working for Disney here. So at Disney World in Florida, 1987, he, he applies ornament. <laughs> I mean, you know, there's no debating the fact that there's ornament on this building. Uh, and like in the postmodern style, it's exaggerated in scale and all that. So here he's applying the swans. Uh, on the on the top and he's got these giant seashells and you know I guess if you're a kid and you're going to Disney World you see this and you go oh wow that's so cool look at the shells and the swans on top of the building um, I look at this as a grown-up and I think <laughs> but you know this is this is part of that movement uh, from the 80s I came out of the 80s so you can probably go eh, when you think of me and my taste but uh, here is um, the Denver Public Library from 1990. Um, it, not quite so dramatic in the overscaled ornamentation here, um, but again, the, the forms, the way he's using different geometric massings and forms, triangles and circles and 
cylinders and and then this just sort of weird roof plane on top held up by these um, angled beams uh, or columns to to support it you know is is a mishmash of things going on here and it makes the building visually interesting uh, and it breaks down the massing so it's not just a big giant ECN box uh, and that's that's what he was trying to achieve here all right, so here is one of the items. This is probably one of his most famous designs for Target uh, from 1984. And you can still see these. I mean, the originals are probably, you know, collector's <laughs> items now. But um, I think Target still sells some of the Michael Graves designed things that, um, you know, spatulas and, you know, I don't know, toilet brush. I know brush. Uh, brushes were something with a funky little handle on it. Uh, but, you know, it has a little bird on top. And so when the tea kettle boils, uh, the, the bird sings, you know, goes, Whoo. <laughs> and then we have our own example right here in Chicago, uh, the Harold Washington Library, which was completed in 1991 by Thomas Beebe of Hammond Beebe Babka. Uh, this is probably our most famous uh, postmodern design. Uh, and this is another example here. We've got all the elements of postmodernism. We've got the exaggerated forms, these massive Roman arched windows, the base with, you know, more Roman arches and, uh, you know, a, a sort of angle or sloped roof. And then these giant gargoyles at the corners and then the center here, all made out of copper, you know, pretty expensive building to build, actually. Um, you know, but of an exaggerated scale, fully applied, you know, fully ornamental, absolutely no functionality to this, uh, to these elements. Um, here's another view of that. Um, to me, I look at this building, I think it's crap. <laughs> I mean, that's just my own personal opinion. Uh, and I have a number of reasons. Oh, look at the swags on the building here on the side. It's just like a taking things, blowing them up and then applying them to the building. Um, just to create something visually interesting. There's no, um, there's really no rhyme or reason or purpose to it. Um, and I, to me, I just, you know, I, I like international style architecture and Mesian architecture. I like other styles of architecture. Um, I, you know, I, I'm no, I have no problem with ornament and all that, but I just find this to be proportionally so out of scale that it's not pleasing to me, but People have different opinions. Some people love this building. So, uh, you know, that's what makes great architecture. It's like art, you know, everybody sees it differently and has a different opinion about it. And that was inspired by the um, Rookery building by Burnham and Root, uh, which has, you know, the granite base with a big Roman arch and it has, you know, more Roman arched windows in it. And then it doesn't quite have the giant gargoyles on the top, but it has these sort of corner turrets uh, on this. So if we go back, you know, to the Washington Library, you see, you know, the granite base, the Roman arched openings and windows, and then these sort of corner and center elements. Uh, just like the 190 South LaSalle, it's not a copy. It's just sort of an inspirational um, interpretation of that. Oh, here's a detail. Whoops, sorry. Here's a detail of the gargoyle on the top, an owl, which represents wisdom, and he's holding, you know, a, a scroll of paper or whatever, representing, you know, it's a, that it's a library. So there is some symbolism included in this um, beyond just applied ornament, but. Okay, so that's postmodernism. Let's talk a little bit about planning in the, the sort of the mid to late 20th century. Um, basically after World War II in America and what happens here. And what we really get, and I talked about this with when we were talking about the American modernism, you know, in that post-World War II era, uh, of how people really wanted to reject um, the previous few decades, you know, the 30s of the Depression, the 40s of World War II. Um, buildings and cities had really decayed in that time, you know, throughout the entire Depression uh, and World War II, um, there was very little investment in buildings by building owners. You know, they, you know, they didn't have the money. You know, the tenants and you know leases and things weren't supporting buildings the way they had been. Uh, you couldn't get building supplies. You couldn't get workers during the World War II because they were off fighting the war or using materials to build uh, war machinery. So, um, 
by the time we get to the 1950s, when uh, construction really begins again and, and the economy booms, um, people wanted to reject that. They're like, you know, these old decrepit buildings, these cities that are run down, they're, they're slummy, they're, you know, tenements and uh, decayed. People wanted something different, and it helped to coincide with the rise of the automobile. Uh, you know, almost everybody by the 1950s could start to afford an automobile, at least one car. And, you know, they needed some place to park it. They needed some place to park it when they got home, but they also needed some place to park it at the office. And so, you know, we started tearing down buildings to make parking lots. We started to build these super highways, uh, which came about during the Eisenhower administration as a way to connect cities uh, and, and very successful in doing that. But, you know, you, asked, you had to get not just get to the city boundary, you had to get to downtown and so they just sliced these highways straight through um, these urban uh, environments uh, and you know and people started saying you know let's revitalize our city how are we going to do that let's just tear down the old stuff and we'll build these shiny glass and steel buildings uh, to, to build something new and so it's a really radical um, transformation of American society and culture this goes way beyond uh, just architecture and planning I mean American culture dramatically shifts um, starting in the 1950s um, and a lot of this because of what we see here you know this is a image of Levittown New York um, an early suburban housing complex we had sur suburbs before we talked about Riverside you know solar suburbs um, around Chicago like Oak Park and Evanston um, were well established in the early late 19th early 20th century but they were mostly a continuation of the urban fabric you know if, if you think of Oak Park you know, and uh, these other older suburbs, whether it's Maywood or Forest Park and all there, you know, the grid system continues. Uh, you have more density. You got big apartment buildings in many cases. You have almost a center downtown area. Um, you know, they're focused on the train lines and so forth. Uh, but by the 1950s, uh, suburbs become completely auto dependent. Um, there's no more downtown necessary. Um, you just need commercial strips along a highway with big parking lots. We'll talk about shopping malls in a minute. And, you know, you got to have a garage. You got to have a driveway for each house. Uh, we get rid of the alleys. Uh, everybody, all the houses now are accessed off the front with the driveway and the garage in front. And so what do you see when you see one of these suburban houses? You see a big honking garage. That's the image you see of a house, not of a porch, not where people can sit out and chat with their neighbors. It, it just radically transforms American life and culture. And that's going to have a reaction, as we'll see a little later, too. Uh, and, you know, when you take that to an extreme, I don't even know where this is, but um, you, you get this, right? You get just the urban sprawl of American cities um, that, you know, you have these main arteries that are, you know, at least four lanes, sometimes five of the center turn lane, sometimes six, seven, eight lanes wide. Um, you Then you get the sort of residential streets that go around and they often meander, they, they break up the grid like Riverside did um, to create cul-de-sacs where, you know, cul-de-sacs are great because otherwise you got all these cars whipping by and your kids are gonna get hit by a car if they're out riding their bike or playing a game. Uh, and so with a cul-de-sac, you know, it's just the neighbors that are driving in and they're going slower. Um, so we start to see a lot of those development and, and the curve it forms help to break up the monotony of the grid, which, you know, can be kind of monotonous. If you go to Berwyn or Cicero and you see block after block after block of bungalows, they all, they sort of all look the same, just as we start to see these suburban tract houses almost all look the same. And the other distinctive thing here is that it, it becomes a, a, a society that is completely auto-dependent. There is no longer an ability, even if you wanted to, to walk anywhere. Um, you have to get in your car and go somewhere. If you want to go to the corner store to pick up milk, for you know, uh, you got to get in the car and go to the corner drugstore or store or something like that. Or if you want to do grocery shopping, you go all the way to a big grocery store shopping center um, you know if you 
want to go to the post office, if you've got to do something, you know, get a haircut, whatever, you can't just walk to your, you know, little commercial district anymore that's, a, you know, a few blocks away. You have to get in the car and drive. And it can be very isolating because if you don't have a car, if you're too young, kids are somewhat more isolated. Or if you're older and, you know, driving is no longer a good option for you, um, then you're really stuck. Uh, and you don't have a lot of options in this kind of environment. So there's a lot of downsides to it um, for all the upsides that, you know, people embraced. So here's uh, a view of Chicago. This is the what they call the circle interchange. I, I don't know, they call it the Jane Byrne now or something like that. But um, uh, they called it the circle uh, when it was built because, you know, in aerial view, it was like one massive giant circle. And this is where, you know, the Eisenhower comes in. You got the Kennedy over here on the t upper left. Uh, the Eisenhower is coming down here on the lower right. And then it, you know, connects into the um, Dan Ryan heading south uh, or coming from the south on the right side here. And then all that feeds into and out of, you know, the loop. So all of these sprawling suburban developments that are occurring, like we just saw all around Chicago and the west, northwest, south sides. Um, now all these people have to drive into the city to go to work. And, you know, this is where they all meet up. And it's a massive interchange, which, as you know, if you've been downtown, you know, in the last few years, has been under reconstruction for like a decade. And it's got a few more years to go. They keep extending the deadline. It's so massive. It is, and of course, trying to rebuild it without shutting it down completely is complicated, too. So it's it's just an enormity. Look how many city blocks had to be demolished to to make way for this. You know, I mean, before these highways were built in the 50s and 60s, this was just urban fabric. These were all city blocks of commercial buildings and, you know, residences. And of course, you know, the highways as they swoop out into the suburbs, as they, you know, slice through the city, all were massive demolition projects in order to make way for that. And that really has a that had a dramatic impact on city life. Um, and of course, most of them went through poor neighborhoods. Um, you know, poor people don't have generally the political resources to fight city hall uh, to to fight these and resist it. Whereas a more you know Oak Park, which was a you know more middle class, uh, upper class community, um, they they forced the highway to get depressed. You know, and that helps to uh, reduce the noise and the impact of the, the neighborhoods around it. But through the city, you know, in these poorer neighborhoods, they just sliced right on through wherever they wanted to go and, you know, displaced a lot of people and disrupted a lot of, um, you know, community life and culture. Uh, and a lot of these were poor minority, mostly black uh, neighborhoods. And uh, in many ways, they never really recovered after that. Uh, and one of the results of that is another kind of urban planning approach, which um, we first saw and talked a little bit about um, uh, with Le Corbusier's Plan Voisin for Paris of 1925, which was his concept. It was just a fantasy, but it was his concept to sort of eliminate uh, a huge swath of, of medieval Paris and instead build these tall towers and gardens. Uh, they would be surrounded by greenery and trees and people could um, take the elevator out of their building and, and have a park-like setting outside, um, but they would be connected with, you know, larger roads and highways, uh, and there would be a lot more, you know, 1925 was the advent of the automobile, so he was already envisioning the idea that many of these people would, you know, would have automobiles, um, and so, you know, it was just a planning concept, uh, and people were horrified by this, like, how, how dare you? How could you tear down Paris and build all these big old skyscrapers? Well, that's what Americans did. Um, and we get things like uh, the pruitt Igo complex in St. Louis. Um, this is from 1954. And it's the Plan Voisin. I mean, it's directly almost 100% the Plan Voisin from, you know, 25 years earlier. Uh, this is by Minoru Yamasaki, uh, a Japanese uh, I think he was Japanese-born uh, architect uh, who um, became an important modernist architect in America. Um, and you can see the city 
intact all around it. And then, you know, the grid, the, the smaller scale buildings, and then you have these big towers. Um, you see a lot of parking. Um, there, this is still somewhat under construction. You see some blank spaces still left here. Uh, but here's the greenery. Um, one of the problems was that the greenery and the parks never were very successful and well maintained. And so most of them just turned into mud pits. Um, and this project, this was for lower income uh, communities. This was a solution to uh, very poor housing conditions and neighborhood conditions, especially of minorities. And, um, you know, like, well, let's tear down these slum neighborhoods and we'll build these nice, shiny, modern apartment buildings for them to live in. And at the time, this was radical. This was groundbreaking. Um, people thought it was very progressive. Like, hey, we're giving good quality housing to, um, to you know, mostly black um, and other communities it might be Hispanic com um, residents. And in a way, this was seen as as the solution. This would be great. This is this is a way to help lift people out of poverty, give them a decent place to live in public housing. And it was a massive ultimate failure. The whole system uh, just really never worked. Uh, this is Pruitt-Igo in 1972. They're tearing it down. Uh, it really quickly became uh, a slum in itself. Uh, they were poorly built. You know, this was public housing. And so, you know, low bidders, low budgets, um, little to no maintenance. Um, and, uh, you know, the, it, it had broken up the, the neighborhood, the cohesiveness of the neighborhood, you know, so where families could kind of watch over each other and, you know, watch over kids of your neighbors and things. Um, now you're just stuck into these little apartments with no, with no community. And it really broke down some of the bonds of community that even though they were living in really pretty shitty housing, um, they, they had a community, they had each other, and that was no longer the case. And, you know, it got, they, they got infested with gangs and with drugs, and uh, they became, to, to most of them got to the point where they just started tearing them down. That, that was the only solution. Um, and so this didn't even last 20 year, 25 years. I mean, that, that's how quickly this thing failed. Um, and, it, and it failed fast. After, the Pruitt-Igo is the most notorious, um, you know, and, and it just failed really fast and, you know, quickly opened people's eyes to this was not the solution. This is not the way to address poverty and, and poor housing condition. And the same thing happened in Chicago. This is uh, all along the Dan Ryan um, uh, expressway all the way from just below the loop to all almost to Hyde Park um, was a massive urban renewal project where they just tore down block after block after block of housing and commercial districts to build these towers and gardens. Uh, some of them were called like Stateway Gardens was the name of one of them. Um, this is um, this is the view of them. Um, what was the, the Henry, Henry Horner Homes? There was a, a number, uh, the Robert Taylor Homes, uh, a whole bunch of names of these different complexes. And similar, they, they it took them a little longer uh, to tear these down. I think these were mostly torn down in the 90s. Um, but, you know, these eventually were all torn down and rebuilt as mixed use um, and trying to mix, you know, poorer people with middle people to give them a little more stability in their neighborhood and in their living environment. Um, this is a, a historic view of the Robert Taylor homes um, soon after it was built. And, you know, there was, there actually was some resistance when these were coming down in the nineties, um, because as bad as they were, um, with, with dr dr drugs and gangs and, and just deterioration, uh, there were still people did build a community out of them. And, you know, there's an example of, of people who tried to try to make their life better. And you see that today in urban neighborhoods of people trying to resist the the negative issues of the drugs and gangs and, and violence, um, but it you know it can be overwhelming. And ultimately, the solution in Chicago and almost all of these other cities with this, these public housing complexes were to just tear them down and try to start over. Uh, here's some views um, from the Robert Taylor Homes. Um, it, you know, a lot of people started equating these with um, basically urban prisons. Um, if we were either sending young black people to prison literally, 
or they were living in conditions like this where, you know, you got fencing and chain links and, you know, it, it wasn't much better than jails and prisons. And, um, you know, it, it's not hard to imagine how these turned into um, slums themselves uh, when you see this kind of uh, environment. Uh, this is one example that did survive. This is the Dearborn Homes in sh on the Chicago South Side uh, by Halliburton and Root from 1949. Halliburton and Root, you know, pretty prominent firm. Some of these architects for these complexes were major names, Yamasaki, uh, Halliburton and Root. Um, but the, again, they were left with, or they were given really bad budgets and, you know, the, the overall plan itself just didn't work. But um, so often the budgets were poor. Uh, these were a little better designed, a um, little smaller scale. They weren't quite as large um, and they did survive. They got redone um, in the 2010s um, uh, with some upgrades to improve them. And so um, they've added <laughs> they've added some brick or stone coins and little parapets on the top to make them a little more attractive, I guess. Um, but um, they, they, these, these survive, but just almost all the rest of them have been torn down, not just in Chicago, but throughout uh, most American cities. Yeah, I mean, you know, as Jermon is saying that your cousin lives in these, um, it's, it, I haven't been in them, but you know, this, these were built a little better to be sure um, than some of the other ones. Um, and that's partly why they did survive because they were in better condition. The apartments were nicer, um, it, but they were fully gutted rehabbed. Um, uh, nonetheless, um, uh, but this is, you know, this is a little better scale too. The, these aren't massive, you know, towers, uh, and they try to mix up the use, you know, it's not just a, a building for poor people. Um, if you mix, you know, lower income working people, lower income subsidized housing with, you know, more middle class apartments and stuff that helps to stabilize the community. It helps to stabilize the building and you're not, concentrating all that poverty into one place. So. At least that's the theory today. In maybe 20 years, we're going to look back at some of the things we do now and say, why, would, why did we do that? So um, another result of this um, suburbanization of America starting in the 1950s is the shopping mall. Uh, this is the considered to be kind of the first regional mall uh, from 1956 uh, in the Southdale Shopping Mall in Edina, Minnesota. Why Minnesota? I don't know, <laughs> but uh, I guess because it's cold and uh, you get nasty winters. So people wanted a lot of indoor shopping. So it made sense. I don't know. Uh, this was by Victor Gruen and Associates. Um, so here's Victor Gruen. Here's another guy. He came, he worked for Peter Behrens. He was an Austrian, emigrated to America in the 30s, fleeing the Nazis. Uh, he came, totally came out of the modernist, you know, international style tradition. And he becomes the grandfather of shopping malls. I mean, his firm, uh, that's almost all they did was strip malls and indoor shopping malls and um, really became known for that. Uh, kind of an, an irony, I don't know, of, of that. So here are some images of the Southdale Mall. This is a historic view of it uh, from 1956. You can see all the big giant 1950s cars in the parking lot. And notice, massive parking lot, right? All around it, a lot of it is empty because if you're gonna have a shopping mall, you need to have enough parking for like the busiest day of the year, right? Which is gonna be at Christmas time, right? The sun, you know, late November, December, when everybody's doing their Christmas shopping, you have to make sure there's enough parking or otherwise people won't go to the mall. They can't. So generally, uh, the rest of the year, these parking lots are almost totally empty. You know, right around the, the main entries and department stores, they might be busier and you might have to circle a little bit looking for a space. But on the outlying areas, you have these just massive, giant, empty parking lots. Um, and then the way the shopping mall worked, and you can see it here, um, is they would have big anchors. They called them anchors. They would be the big department stores, you know, Marshall Fields and um, Carson Perry Scott or Macy's, um, you know, and most of, you know, these department stores were regional at the time. They came out of the downtowns. A lot of them abandoned downtown locations uh, to move out to these uh, suburban malls. 
And then in between would be an indoor mall of smaller shops and, you know, the, you know, bookstores and, um, you know, clothing, you know, smaller clothing stores. And um, <laughs> when I was growing up, every, every mall had a piano store. I don't know how many people were buying pianos, but every mall had a piano store, um, which was sort of, uh, even then I thought it was kind of weird. It's like, who's buying all these pianos? <laughs> um, but anyway, um, and it was sort of recreating the downtown commercial district, uh, but in an indoor environment. So here was the interior of that. Uh, there would often be like this central plaza with escalators and planters with trees and skylights and, you know, vines hanging over the balconies, uh, all to kind of almost create this, you know, naturalistic setting for this indoor shopping mall. But it would be climate controlled. You'd have your air conditioning in the summer. You'd have your heat in the winter. You wouldn't get rained on, at least, you know, once you got inside. Um, if you were a kid, if you were growing up and you were just old enough to be on your own, you'd come, maybe you'd come with mom and she's like, well, I'm going to go shopping. And you're like, okay, I'm going to hang out in the food court and with my friends and you could safely hang out for hours. You know, maybe there was a, there's a food court, there was maybe a, um, theater or something. You could watch movies. Uh, this was like the place where kids hang out, um, you know, in my generation, the 80s, 90s, and even into the 2000s. And you see all kinds of movies from that era of this is what kids did, you know, um, Fast Times at Ridgemont High, a classic early 80s movie. Uh, it's, you know, it's centered on life in the mall almost. Um, so, you know, I think a lot of your generation maybe missed that. I'm not sure. Um, but this, this was life for us uh, when I was growing up. And, you know, that continued on. This is the Mall of America uh, in Bloomingdale, Minnesota from 1992. And this was the biggest mall in America at that time. It was a big thing. Like, wow, we're going to be the biggest, you know, ever. Um, and it it was so big, they just repeated most of the stores. You know, there were like three wings and, and you, you could go to one wing and you see the same stores that were in the other wing. I don't know. Uh, but it was so big, there were, the next slide, there was like a whole indoor amusement park. I mean, you talk about just dropping your kids off and say, I'll see you in a few hours while I do shopping. Um, that's, you know, that's, that'd be a pretty cool place. And the malls I went to never had shopping or uh, never had amusement parks like this, but you know, at Christmas time they would set up Santa Claus and there would usually be a little train that you could ride. Um, that was the best I got. I didn't get the roller coasters. But. Okay. So, all of this eventually leads to a backlash, uh, starting in the mid to late 60s and continuing even on today um, is a sort of counter to this urban renewal, the sprawl, the, the just blatant destruction of, of our cities, our neighborhoods, our historic buildings. And that, that spurs the preservation movement. Um, and in many ways, 1966 is kind of seen as like the watershed of, of preservation. That's when um, Congress passes a, a Historic Preservation Act, which actually requires the federal government to, um, to review whether it's appropriate to tear down buildings for its projects, like, you know, slicing highways through cities. Um, and so we start to see that change at the federal level um, and most states and, and even many local communities also you know are sort of spurred to create their own preservation ordinances and and regulations as well and so you know something like city of chicago um, established its preservation landmarks council in i think 1972 and oak park has a preservation ordinance and can landmark buildings and can prevent demolition of significant historic buildings um, and you know it establishes a national register of historic places uh, in which buildings can be nominated for their historic or um, architectural or cultural significance and provides some means of protection um, not completely but um, all of these things are a counter to this wide-scale urban renewal of the 1950s and 60s. And this is a photo of Richard Nickel. Um, the Garrick Theater that we see here was a Louis Sullivan, Adler and Sullivan designed building in the loop. 
and uh, in the 1960s, this was demolished, and this was a an attempt, a little little mini protest here, uh, to try to save the building. It was unsuccessful. A lot of these early preservation battles were. Sometimes they still are, um, but um, you know, it it started to these sorts of things began to raise awareness of the value of historic architecture, and one of the the groundbreaking ones was Penn Station. Uh, this was in New York, um, finished in 1910 by McKim, Mead, and White. It was a massive whole block train station. I talked about this when we talked about um, uh, neoclassical Beaux-Arts architecture, and I think I showed you the image, this image here, of it being torn down in 1963. Um, and it this helped to spur that preservation movement. It got a lot of national attention. A lot of people were horrified that this incredible building was just thrown away. And um, it helped to create a landmarks ordinance in New York City. Uh, and New York now has one of the strongest local uh, landmarks ordinances uh, in the country. And, um, you know, when people saw what replaced it, uh, they thought, wait, what are we doing here? Right. I mean, we, we had this elegant Beaux Arts complex, and now we get this big blank drum. You know, Madison Square Garden, maybe a great place to watch a basketball game, but from an urban, you know, context, from a street life, from you know, just beauty, um, it it was a disaster, and people really reacted to that and said you know, we can't just throw away this really cool, great architecture to build this crap. Um, we we got to do something different. We got to do it better. And I think Madison Square Garden has since been rebuilt. This doesn't even exist anymore. So, you know. And in Chicago, we had our own example. Um, the Probably the, the groundbreaking one uh, was the Chicago Stock Exchange, another Adler and Sullivan building from 1894, uh, classic Chicago school building that, you know, we didn't talk about this one, but, you know, pretty, pretty straightforward um, Louis Sullivan design. And um, here is Richard Nickel again. And there was a big battle to try to save this building. A developer bought it, said, hey, I want to build a modern high rise uh, on the site. And there was a huge battle to try to save this building, but there was no protection. There was no landmarks ordinance. There was no way uh, other than a developer saying, oh, gee, I guess this is important. Maybe I won't do it. Um, you know, just out of their own goodwill, and they weren't, there was too much money at stake, so um, this ultimately got destroyed. And this actually um, uh, became almost a martyrdom. Uh, Richard Nickel, who had fought so long and hard to save many of these buildings and to document them, salvage pieces from them when they were being destroyed, uh, was actually killed tragically uh, during the demolition of the stock exchange. He uh, he had been given permission to come in, onto the site and to salvage ornament and pieces. This is from the trading room, and he and John Vincy had been, uh, and Tim Samuelson had been salvaging elements from the trading room. Um, but um, as the demolition progressed, the, the the demo company told him, "Okay, you're done. You can't come back." And Nickel would sneak in on the weekends, uh, you know, under the fence and. Um, uh, on one weekend, uh, he was supposed to meet Tim Samuelson, and Tim said he never showed up. And um, they, several weeks later, they, as the building got down to the bo bottom, they found his body buried in rubble. They think it just, you know, a, a floor collapsed. It was unstable uh, because of the demo, and it collapsed on him, and he was tragically killed. So he's considered to be kind of a martyr for historic preservation. And later, um, John Vincy, a uh, very important local architect, um, rebuilt the Stock Exchange trading room at the Art Institute in one of the wings of the Art Institute. And you can still go in here. Um, it's way off in the back. It's kind of an obscure location. They'll do a lot of, they don't do, you know, exhibitions in here so much, but they'll do if, um, presentations or um, lectures and stuff in here. I've been in a few times. Uh, and it's a very nice, beautiful recreation of that space uh, and the, the design and decoration that Louis Sullivan had designed uh, for the original trading room. And then they also rebuilt the entry arch. Uh, this is on the back side, so this would be on the east side off Columbus Drive of the uh, Art Institute. So if you're driving up on Columbus Drive sometime and you see this, that's the entrance 
gateway to the old stock exchange. And this was also salvaged by Vinci and Nickel um, before the building was fully demolished. So. Uh, and then, you know, preservation um, in many ways was about, and, and one of the criticisms of it was, you know, well, we're saving, you know, rich white people's houses, you know, Mount Vernon, you know, that makes sense. It's, you know, home of George Washington, but, you know, the, the plantations houses in the South, which, you know, are controversial because of what they represent, or, you know, the, the wealthy, you know, mansion in every town's got, you know, a handful of wealthy mansions, depending on how big the town is, um, you know, and they're beautiful, they're great architecture, uh, and we should save those. But, you know, we started to get, even by the late 70s, people starting to say, well, we should be saving ordinary architecture. We should be saving, you know, communities, not just buildings, one-off buildings here and there. And so one of the things that arises out of that idea is what was called the Main Street Program with um, the National Trust for Historic Preservation. And the idea was to revitalize uh, small town centers, the commercial districts of small towns, which had been decimated by urban sprawl. You know, the new shopping malls uh, on the edge of town, whether it was a big shopping mall or whether it was just a strip mall on a small town, um, you know, that's where all the businesses wanted to go. They had parking, they were modern, they had air conditioning, and the, the, the old 19th century commercial buildings in downtowns were left empty and decayed. And communities started to say, hey, we got to do something about that. And this was a program to really help revitalize these downtowns um, using historic preservation as a basis, not just bulldozing it, but to, to sort of rehab these buildings and to attract maybe not the big department stores anymore and the convenience stores, but, you know, bookstores and antique stores and knickknack shops or specialty shops that people would want to visit, um, you know, and be in an environment that was unique, you know. And this is an image of Madison, Indiana, down in southeast uh, Indiana along the Ohio River. And this is a town that had been passed over uh, the, you know, didn't have a railroad. And so when the steamboat era ended, there's a, you know, a reproduction steamboat that you can still ride the Ohio River on. But when, you know, when this ended as a transportation system in the late 19th century, uh, the town died, you know, and it just sort of stayed put, you know, people didn't tear the buildings down, but they didn't build any new buildings. And so it never got sort of rebuilt and modernized. And so by the late 70s, the town was like, let's embrace preservation and let's make it an attraction where people can come and visit. Uh, this is a 1950s view of the Main Street in Madison. And it still looks like this today, uh, different cars um, and different dress uh, or you know clothing fashions but you know all these buildings were here and people said wow you just don't see this anymore you know so many downtowns were re you know rebuilt over time and you know modern buildings and all that and so this is a major tourist attraction just because it looks like this because it's still historic and in fact my parents in the 1990s actually ran a bed and breakfast in Madison um, you know, and that was another thing that comes out of this movement, you know, take, you know, instead of a, a motel on the edge of town, take an old house and, you know, renovate it so that people can stay in the old bedrooms. And um, that's, that's what a bed and breakfast is. And um, people like that. Oh, here's a, a modern image of Madison. So the cars are different, but the town is still the same. Uh, it really hasn't changed in well over 100 years, uh, the buildings, at least in the architecture. And the same thing happened in Galena, Illinois. I don't know if you're all, you may be more familiar with Galena. Um, your parents probably are, you've heard of it. Um, and this is up in northwestern corner of the state, you know, about two, two and a half hours from here. And same thing. It's a town that got passed over. Uh, the railroad bypassed it. So, um, you know, the, the superhighways bypassed it. And so it just sort of sat uh, in its late 19th century splendor. And by the 1970s and 80s, um, people started to restore the buildings, you know, put in little shops, art galleries, fudge shops, you know, bookstores, antique stores, the houses, the big houses were turned into bed and breakfasts. And, you know, there's a couple of historic sites, uh, um, 
uh, Ulysses S. Grant lived here before the war, and so there's you can tour the Grant House and things like that. But uh, for the most part, people just like coming here because it's something so different than what they're used to. You know, in their communities, they've got you know shopping malls, urban strips, or suburban strips, um, and you know to have this quaint little town with all this beautiful brick and stone architecture. You know, this is what people go to Europe for in many cases, um, but you can get it right here in, in America. And so this really creates a, a whole economic engine called heritage tourism, where if you've got an historic town or an old downtown or neighborhood, um, people will want to come and see that. And they'll, they'll spend money there. They'll eat in restaurants. They'll stay in bed and breakfast and inns. And that's a huge industry now and cannot be overlooked as, as a major driver of many communities uh, to, for their economy. And we see that even in Oak Park, um, which has a, a really historic you know, community. Uh, people come from all over the country, even all over the world, to see Frank Lloyd Wright houses. Uh, and this is an image of the Wright Plus tours that happen uh, usually each May, not not lately with the pandemic, but um, thousands of people will come to Oak Park and spend the day going through Frank Lloyd Wright houses and some of the other historic homes in the neighborhoods here, and line up and you know they'll they'll have lunch in town, they'll you know do some shopping, they might stay in the local hotels and so forth. So this is the kind you know most communities have some kind of annual house walk just for this purpose. Um, you know another big one is in Pasadena with all the bungalows down in Southern California, um, they have a big giant house walk every year and people want to see all these bungalows. So it's a huge industry and it's a, it's a major tourist attraction now in many cities. And then there's other restoration. Um, this is more straightforward architectural restoration. Um, this is of the Reliance building in Chicago. Uh, this was a classic, Chicago School Building, we talked about it, really important by um, Burnham and Company. And uh, the, the image on the left is the historic view of it after it got built. And then the image in the center is what it looked like in the 19, by 19, early 1990s. Um, you know, it was really decrepit. It had been poorly maintained and really began to fall apart. Uh, there was, um, there was a drugstore and the base of the building that basically let the owner pay the taxes. Uh, the rest of the tower was either abandoned or had psychics and, and palm readers in it. Uh, it was really sort of strange. I've seen photos of, of that. Um, I worked on the late stages of the restoration of this. Uh, so in the mid-90s, the city of Chicago actually bought the building and paid to restore the exterior. And then they sold it for like a dollar to a private developer to renovate and re-adaptive reuse the interior of boutique hotel. And a boutique hotel is like a bed and breakfast on steroids. You t it's a bigger scale. A bed and breakfast might be, you know, two, three, four, five bedrooms in a house. A boutique hotel is like, okay, you've got a tower that's 15 stories tall, and we we make cool little funky bedrooms um, or you know hotel rooms in the tower. Um, and this became, this was the, really the first time this was done in Chicago. It had been done in New York and, and San Francisco a little bit. Um, and the developer was actually out of San Francisco, so they kind of knew what they were doing. And so it's, this was finished in 1998, and this spurred a massive um, uh, adaptive reuse effort for a lot of these old Chicago school buildings to be turned into either boutique hotels or to, like, apartment housing, mostly for students. Um, a lot of, you know, the loop turned into a nine to five office area, uh, even as late as the mid 1990s, to a more 24 seven neighborhood. Uh, people live here, um, you know, a lot of students at the Roosevelt and Columbia College and so forth, School of the Art Institute. Uh, they're living in some of these old office buildings like this. And, um, you know, there's a lot more apartment development now, even modern big new modern high rises that are, you know, that are apartment buildings. Um, that puts people on the street. That means you need grocery stores, you need drug stores, uh, and there's life on the street after five o'clock, after all the business people go home, our office workers go home. Um, now you got the residents and they're hanging out in the loop. And, you know, uh, Mayor Daly um, revitalized the, the theater um, 
district, uh, and that helps attract people. Um, this had a really nice restaurant in it um, when it opened up, and that was one of the first sort of nice restaurants in the loop uh, to go to, other than some of the old classics like the Berghoff and so forth, So, or in hotels. Um, and so this, this was really a huge thing. State Street got revitalized, and they used... Um, a, a process called tax increment financing. I'm not going to go into it, but it's basically using city money to reinvest in buildings. And the idea is that the city would invest in a building like restoring the exterior, and then that would help spur other development uh, that would boost property tax values and therefore boost you know, revenue and it would help encourage, you know, more businesses and all that. It's a help is it, these are tools to help revitalize downtowns in this case in a really big way with Chicago, but even small towns can do this, um, you know, for their main street. And I've just got a few images of the restoration process. So here's some before and afters of the storefront it had to be totally rebuilt. Um, the terracotta of the upper floors had to be um, really cleaned and repaired. Um, almost a quarter of the pieces of terracotta had to be replaced. They were in bad shape. Um, the, the old fire escapes that you see here were removed off the building, so, and they put in new fire stairs on the interior. Here's the uh, before and after of the entrance. Um, again, almost completely rebuilt uh, in order to restore this. Uh, just really brought this building back to its glory. This was a view of the interior. I worked on the interior. I worked on this lobby here. This is one of my first projects to work on. And um, we have an historic view of the open cage elevators. And then this is what it looked like in the middle. Uh, you know, it got changed in the 1940s. And, and then we essentially rebuilt it. None of these materials were left uh, other than a little fragments of the terrazzo floor that we could copy. Um, but all this marble, recreating this uh, iron grill of the elevators. Of course, we had to put in walls behind that, so you know, couldn't have an open cage anymore uh, for fire reasons and for safety reasons. But um, but we were able to recreate the wrought iron work based on these photos and some drawings. Um, it was a really big accomplishment. Uh, won a lot of awards uh, when it was completed. So I was kind of proud to work on that. So I like showing you that project. Okay.